Hello and welcome to Geekarate. For geeks, by geeks, and with geeks. Life for love of the earth. Welcome to Overtime. Brave enough to do battle with hideous monsters. I am Finistar. Hello and welcome to Geekarati. My name is Christian Lindke and I'm your regular host and author of the Geekarati Substack. I'm here today to talk about Superhero 2044. It's the first superhero role-playing game ever written and it's an interesting entry in the development of role-playing games and the history of role-playing games in general. But because Superhero 2044 is a very old and rather obscure game, I'm going to give a bit of a long preface here. Additionally, I have written a post about Superhero 2044 on my Substack, and you can read that there, and it will repeat much of what I'm saying here in this video, because I want to share the story of Superhero 2044 in as many places and as many media as possible. You might want to listen to this, you might want to watch it, or you might want to read it, all of which have different advantages. So, why Superhero 2044? Well, I have two reasons for my particular enthusiasm here. First, I'm a huge fan of superhero role-playing games in general. At one time, I could honestly say that I owned every superhero role-playing game in publication. Given that there's been a huge explosion of the PDF marketplace and independent games in general, this is no longer the case. I still own a ton of superhero role-playing games, but I no longer own all of them. Second, as you will you know, hear in this overall discussion, I was pleasantly surprised by Superhero 2044. It was a much better game than I expected it to be. People have often described the game as unplayable, but that's not quite true. Superhero 2044 is a clear demonstration of the wild creativity of the early RPG community, a wild creativity that still exists in various corners of the hobby. One of the things I love about the role-playing game hobby is that it is very much a DIY hobby. But more than that, more than either one of those, Superhero 2044 is an example of how hard it is to create games in a really chaotic environment with no real basis or no real example for you to follow. Over the course of the next couple of years, probably, I'll be doing a series of articles and videos that will attempt to review and discuss most of the major superhero role-playing games and a couple of key supplements, like Aaron Alston's Strike Force, which is an absolute must-own for every gamer, whether you're a superhero gamer or just a D&D gamer. I want to go over them, and there have been so many published over the years. But I'm going to alternate new and old a bit, because... One, I'd like to do my Marvel review for the new Marvel game by Matt Forbeck sooner rather than later. And given that I own a large catalog, sadly, as I mentioned, not all of the superhero role-playing games that have ever been published to date, it'll be a fun exercise. Some of the games that you'll be reading and hopefully watching about soon are Villains of Vigilante's first edition, which I'll have a review of on written in written form this week, and Super Game, which is an excellent an interesting game to come out of the California market or California community. In fact, the same community that John Eric Holmes, the creator of the first basic set for Dungeons and Dragons, was a part of. Arrow Games, the store where the Thief class was invented and where John Eric Holmes played D&D, also was the home of the creator of the Super Game, role-playing game. So let's give a bit of background on Superhero 2044. According to Heroic Worlds, a vital book that everybody should own, written by Lawrence Schick, if you're a creator, if you're a historian, if you're just interested in the history of role-playing games and the development of them, you absolutely must track down a copy of Heroic Worlds. According to his book, and according to 
issue 23 of Different Worlds magazine in an article by Steve Perrin. Once again, another thing that you just absolutely must own if you are at all interested in superhero role-playing games. Different Worlds number 23 is the holy grail of gaming magazines about superhero role-playing games. It's just got a ton of information. Anyway, according to both of those articles, or both of those sources, Superhero 2044 by Donald Saxman is the first commercially available superhero-themed role-playing game. Saxman's game was initially published in 1977, so three years after D&D, under the name of Superhero 44. The game wasn't entitled Superhero 2044 until the game was published later in the same year in a second edition by Luzaki's Game Science. While I'm a huge fan of superhero role-playing games and a student of the history of RPGs, or at least a casual student of the history of RPGs, this game sat on my bookshelf for years without a complete reading. Its lack of a list of itemized superpowers or even mechanics of how superpowers work was one of the key reasons that the game languished for so long on my shelf without a thorough examination. Apparently, Donald Saxman intentionally left a formal list of superpowers out of the book in order to respect the copyrights of various comic book publishers. Though this didn't stop artist Mike Cagle from providing a cover illustration filled with characters who bear an uncanny resemblance to many popular superhero characters. Donald Saxman was inspired to create this superhero role-playing game when he was a player in a D&D campaign run by science fiction and fantasy author John M. Ford, called by his friends Mike Ford, and uh, himself a designer for Steve Jackson Games eventually. Ford's game featured an adventure in which the party of magicians and swordsmen met Batman and Doc Savage, and ultimately fought Doctor Doom and Darkseid with the help of Luke Cage and the Phantom Stranger. First off, that sounds amazing. I wish that I was there. From that short bit of description of Ford's campaign, which comes, by the way, from the Superhero 2044 rulebook, one can see how this kind of high-concept mashup could inspire players to design all kinds of things. After two years of work, designing and playtesting, and a lot of help from his friends, Donald Saxman created Superhero 2044, the role-playing game. Now, if it's two years that it took them to design it, that means the game was in either late 74 or early 75. We're talking about this superhero-themed role-playing session happened in the first year of D&D's existence. So, keep that in mind. I mean, that's really... I think very intriguing how quickly the game changed and how that inspired the Superhero 2044 role-playing game. Now while Lawrence Schick and others have stated that the game was influenced by D&D, and certainly this D&D session was central, a close reading of the game, which I've done a couple of times now, shows that few if any of those influences were mechanical. Saxman writes that one of his chief influences was GDW's early role-playing game On Guard, and that he made a conscious effort to avoid being influenced by D&D. And I can say I own On Guard as well, and I don't... I'm not quite certain how that influenced Superhero 2044 either, except maybe by pointing toward a more theater-of-the-mind experience that early D&D suggests, that the early D&D rulebook talks about using miniatures in has a heavy war game influence. But I don't know really what what on guards contributions were to give a brief overview of the game superhero 2044 begins with a description of the game universe the majority of gameplay will take place on the island of inguria a city that's kind of a cross between macross city and the future cities of the legion of superheroes and what's interesting here is one it predates Robotech being released in the United States, and the second is that there are also a number of creative influences here on exhibition and a combination that results in this setting being one of the game's biggest assets. The game has a rich world in which to play, and it's quite remarkable how much world design Saxman managed to fit into so few pages. We're not talking about a 120-page tome. We're not talking about a 200-page tome. 
we're talking about about 40 pages of written text, most of which are focused on this setting, and there are quite a few Im illustrations as well. So it's interesting to see how much is packed into just a tiny space. Now, to be honest and to be fair, there is a lot of the granular details that are left for game masters like you and me to fill in, but the big picture is presented in a manner that a lot of modern games would do well to emulate. I'm telling you, just make games like this and provide as much setting material as is needed, but don't worry about providing too much. Give the game masters some room to put their own spice on the setting that you've given them. Like many games being released around the same time, for example, Metagaming's Melee was published in the same year, Superhero 2044 features a point-based build system. In this case, players have 140 points to spend on a number of character attributes. These are Vigor, Stamina, Endurance, Mentality, Charisma, Ego, and Dexterity. Now right away, the f those first three, Vigor, Stamina, Endurance, those sound like the same thing. And what's interesting is they are not. In fact, Stamina, which I would think relates to like the health of the character, but so too with Vigor and Endurance, has nothing to do with it. It is strictly a representation of hand-to-hand -hand fighting ability and overall physical capability. I think it would have been better for Stamina to be called Melee or Fighting instead, but Donald Saxman just called it stamina. You'll also note that I didn't use the word strength for anything, and vigor isn't really strength, it's actually your health. So I'm going to make a little note here, because I do think that this is important, that, you know, in reading a lot of the criticism of Matt Forbeck's Marvel game that came out last year, I kept reading again and again, there's no strength statistic in this game. How can there be no strength statistic? Well, the first superhero role-playing game didn't have one either. And in fact, it's true of others as well. I'm looking at you, tiny supers, sitting behind me, you amazing, simple, and fun game. It should be noted that players, when they're designing their characters, have to pick from one of three character archetypes. The Ubermensch, which is kind of like Batman, the Toolmaster, which is Iron Man, and the Unique, which is either a mutant or something like Superman, an alien. And each of these modifies the starting attributes of the character accordingly. While there are no strict minimum values for statistics, or even a stated average value for the stats, which I thought was a little odd, there are effective minimums if you want to avoid penalties. For example, if you want your character to start without any limitations or penalties, the game requires the character have a minimum of 20 endurance, 11 vigor, and 6 dexterity. If any of these statistics are lower than these values, then the character suffers some form of penalty. Given that the Toolmaster starts with negative 10 points to the starting value of Endurance, a character has to spend 30 of their starting points on Endurance to avoid any penalty. In, in essence, the Toolmaster character in this way starts with 110 instead of 140 points. It might have been better, in my opinion, to have statistics start at base values and allow players to buy them down to represent a disadvantage, kind of like Champions has, in a matter of a way to increase points to spend on something else instead of starting at these low levels and, and coming up highway, higher. One could, for example, have started each one of the archetypes with the minimum statistics as an average and given out 103 statistic points instead of 140 as it is in the book. Saxman might have also considered using more uniform base values for his statistics. After all, like 20, 11, and 6 seem a little bit odd, whereas champions, the average person has 10 in every stat, or in Marvel Face Rip, the kind of classic Marvel game, everybody who has a typical value has a value of 6. But in Superhero 2044, the average value is different for every statistic. All three of these critiques are issues that are quickly addressed by other superhero RPG designs for point-based systems anyway. Though there is a little bit of this legacy in Super Game. When I talk about that later, you'll see that because Super Game also has this kind of starting with values that have with them a disadvantage before you spend points. 
given that Wayne Shaw's house rules for Superhero 2044, the house rules he presented in the fanzine, in fact, the RuneQuest fanzine called Lords of Chaos, issue 8, by the way, just track that one down, that Wayne Shaw's house rules were one of the inspirations behind Champions. And if you don't believe me, read that first edition of the Champions rulebook. One can hypothesize that the design choices of that game, meaning the base 10 stats, were a direct result, or at least in conversation, with thoughts by Wayne Shaw. And if you're interested in his thoughts on that, you can listen to the 100-minute episode that I did of my regular podcast uh, back in 2014, where I chatted with Wayne Shaw about the history of superhero role-playing games, and in particular, his work on these powers for Superhero 2044 and the influence he had on champions. So once these initial points are spent, or you've you've spent your points on your attributes, you're allowed 50 bonus points to add to one of these in special circumstances to emulate some sort of power. The example that they give is 50 extra endurance versus bullets. And there are a couple of other recommendations to base superpowers that you can do that based on the weapons in the game, or gadgets contained in the game, and there are like two or three sample characters. But there's no list of powers, and there's no real actual power design system. So while there is a point-based system for the purchase of attributes, and if you want to model superhero powers as attributes amplified, you can do that. <clears throat> there's no such system for superpowers at all. Donald Saxman had intended to write three books for the Superhero 2044 system, in which one of the later books would provide a character creation system and a power system, but those books were never published. This doesn't mean that no power design rules were ever published. As I mentioned, Wayne Shaw, who I interviewed in the Geekerati podcast, wrote an extensive superpower design rule set in issue 8 of Neil Shapiro's excellent Lords of Chaos RuneQuest fanzine, as I mentioned before. Shaw also offers up some ideas in an insert to the 2010 reprint of Superhero 2044, a reprint that's very hard to find, and the these editions are a kind of rough photocopy. So if you do happen to track down a copy and it's got these inserted pages in it that seem merely to be a handwritten on photocopy, these are actually those. All of that said, this game is extraordinarily important to the genre. As I mentioned before, the lack of superpower design system meant the game sat on my shelf for some time. When I finally took the time to read the book, I found it to be much better than I expected. While I would argue that without Wayne Shaw's additions in the Lords of Chaos issue 8, the game would be challenging to run, if it had never been published, the modern superhero role-playing game would not be what it is today. The market would not be what it is today. Most of the games that provide the core foundation for superhero gaming would not exist. The game had wide-reaching and wide-ranging effect on other superhero games that came after it. If not for Superhero 2044, there'd be no champions. It just wouldn't exist. Super Game wouldn't exist either. Golden Heroes probably wouldn't exist. And I'd argue that the new Marvel multiverse role-playing game wouldn't exist either. Each of those games lifts at least one concept out of Superhero 2044 and incorporates it into its design. It is more than the first superhero role-playing game. It is the foundation upon which the hobby was built or the genre was built. While it wasn't the absolute first point-based game, it was the first superhero game to include point-based character construction. Though the point expenditure was limited to the building of a character's attributes and were not part of power design, this was still a major shift in game design. This innovation in particular is one of the major starting points for a number of superhero role-playing games, not the least of which is Champions. Earlier I mentioned that the Champions role-playing game was an offshoot of Wayne Shaw's house rules for Super 2044. You may be wondering, just where is Christian getting this information? It sounds made up to me, and, you know, this is the internet, we can make up anything. Well, the first edition of the Champions rulebook specifically mentions the influence that Wayne Shaw's character creation rules had on the game's design. 
But the influence that Superhero 2044 had on Champions reached far beyond having a point-based character design system. It also influenced the combat system. Champions melee combat system is very much an evolution of that in Superhero 2044. In Champions, combat is resolved by taking one character's offensive combat value and subtracting an opponent's defensive combat value. The result of that swift subtraction is then added to 11 to find the number required to hit an opponent on a roll of 3d6. Champions combat is one of the best on the market, and the fact that it uses a comparison of combatants' effectiveness and has a bell curve resolution system are among its chief strengths. As you'll see when I eventually get around to the new Marvel Multiverse role-playing game, this does sound familiar, although that game streamlines the process even more. In Superhero 2044, you don't use offensive combat value. Instead, you take a character's stamina and to subtract the opponent's stamina. The difference between these two numbers is compared to the universal combat matrix, which gives you a number between 3 and 18. That's the number that a character has to roll on three six-sided dice if they're going to hit their opponent. It should be noted that this combat system is only used for melee combat in Superior 2044, and that is the system that I believe forms the foundation of champions combat. There's no denying that the Champions version is more elegant. It is the result, clearly, of gameplay and of playtesting. But keep in mind that both are the result of an initial comparison between abilities that then modify a 3d6 roll. This is the same system, the values just are different. It's as if the designers of Champions playtested and refined the Superhero 2044 role-playing system. Champions has some significant differences overall with the addition of maneuvers and lots of other cool things, but one can see the echoes. Now, Champions wasn't the only game to show this influence. Super Game also was influenced by Superhero 2044's point-based character generation system, and given its own 1980 design date, and the fact that it was part of California gaming culture, as I mentioned before, might hint that Super, Hero, Super Game itself also influenced Champions. Now, I, I don't know that for a certainty, but I wouldn't doubt it. The, the chain, in some ways, might have gone from Superhero 44 to Super Game to Champions. Wayne Shaw certainly knew people in both groups, uh, because Neil Shapiro knew people in both groups, the Arrow Hobbies team, and the Bay Area gamers often met at California gaming conventions, and Champions, of course, was released at a Bay Area gaming convention that was an annual convention in the Bay Area, though for one year was an Origins game fair. So, you know, these are things that are being talked about in both Northern and Southern California, and it's amazing how interconnected these gaming groups were by fanzines and zine culture in an era when there was no internet. I mean, this is 1977 to 1981, the publication of Champions, and yet we have these shared ideas among gamers. So, you know, just think about how integrated we are today and think about how different the world was then, yet they're still integrated, right? Both Superhero 2044 and Super Game feature something that many might... Mm, uh, both Superhero 2044 and Super Game feature something that many modern gamers might consider odd. All of a character's attributes start at zero and can be increased. That itself isn't odd, but what is odd is both games have attribute levels where the character is suffering from a disability. If you start at zero, you are at a disadvantage. You must spend points to remove the disadvantage. It isn't that you can lower your ability to beneath average to gain a benefit of more points. Instead, you start at zero at a level where you're already suffering some form of disadvantage and you can then spend points. For example, in Superhero 2044, if a character has an endurance of less than 20, that character is fatigued or worse. In Super Game, a character with an agony score of less than 15 may either move or attack but only one per turn. 
There are similar penalties for Vigor in Superhero 2044 and Physical Score in Super Game. The names of the attributes and the level of effect are different, but we can see the similarities. Most modern systems would start a character with a base number of points sufficient to not be fatigued or incapacitated, but both Superhero 2044 and Super Game allow for that possibility. In fact, if you don't spend any points, your character literally starts unconscious and remains unconscious until they spend points. But it isn't the point-based character design system where Super Game bears the most similarity to its predecessor. After all, Super Game includes rules for building specific powers in the core rulebook and Superhero 2044 does not. Super Games are not as robust as those later published in Champions, but they are themselves an innovation over the state of gaming at the time and a step beyond what were offered in Superhero 2044. The area where the game, in this case Super Game, most reflects Superhero 2044 is in its ranged combat system. Remember, we had the melee combat system in Champions, and now we've got the ranged combat system. In Superhero 2044, the ranged combat system is really unique. It's decided by rolling a six-sided die, adding and subtracting from that die a number of modifiers. This then sets a target number, which must be rolled or higher on a second roll of a six-sided die. For example, a character with a 20 dexterity has a minus one modifier, shooting an opponent at point blank range, another minus three modifier, with a shoulder weapon, another minus one modifier, rolls a six on the six sided die. This gives a modified result of one, six, minus one, minus three, minus one, equals one. And that means the character hits if the player rolls a one or better on the second roll. This system with some differences in modifier values is the exact same system used in Super Game. The other thing is, is while the math of it is percentage based instead of 3d6 based, the melee combat system also is a comparison of values that if you are equal to your opponent, you have a 55% chance, which is approximately the same as an 11 or less on 3d6. I swear that the roll a d6, follow d6 system seems really familiar to me outside these two games, but I cannot place it. And it's one that I looked to see, was it based on a miniatures role play, or a miniatures combat game or something else, but I couldn't find it. It's just, for me, Super Game and Superhero 2044 are the only places where I've found it for sure. As I mentioned earlier, it's not just Super Game and Champions that have or display the influence of Superhero 2044. Another game is Golden Heroes. And Golden Heroes is a, a UK superhero role-playing game that I think has a lot of things that relate to Superhero 2044. In White Dwarf Magazine Issue 9, game designer Eamon Blumfeld reviews Superhero 2044. The first edition, in fact, actually. It's Superhero 44 that he reviews. And in it, he says, each character fills out a weekly planning sheet indicating whether he's patrolling, resting, training, or researching. This shows how many crimes of what type he stopped that week and what damage to himself without actually having to play the event. This is one of the interesting things about Superhero 2044 that nobody really ever talks about is it allows for that much talked about one for one gameplay that, that some people in the OS are very obsessed with lately, that you just plan out what you do and the game master just resolves it and then gives you the results. Anyway, going back to the review, Bloomfeld says that it's overall good fun and realistic and a welcome addition to any role playing game fans edition, certainly as a postal game it's a great feature, right? So we've got this particular review of this sub-mechanic, right, of what's going on during the week, the weekly planning sheet. And as I said, it's one of the most interesting and playable aspects out of the box of Superhero 2044. These planning sheets include what are called activity blocks, in which players assign particular tasks, like fighting crime and resting. Guess what? Golden Heroes, Games Workshop superhero role-playing game, featured a campaign system that bears no small similarities to that of Superhero 2044. The game mechanics, as far as like how powers work, how characters are designed, entirely different. 
but this component is so similar. Games Workshop was, and still is, the publisher of White Dwarf Magazine. So it's easy to believe that this game review sparked some discussion of planning sheet style gameplay. Golden, Golden Heroes features a campaign system that heavily relies on something that is super, super similar to this 2044 weekly planning sheet. They have a system that uses something called Daily Utility Phase, or DUPs. The game describes them as follows. The scenarios played in each week occupy a certain number of DUPs for the players involved. Any remaining DUPs can be devoted to other pursuits such as training, improving powers, developing scientific gadgets. Thus, at the end of each scenario, you must inform the players how many spare DUPs their characters have. Preferably then, or worst, at the start of the next game session, players must tell you how their characters have spent those DUPs. The player's allocation of those DUPs is compared to various campaign ratings, something very similar to what Superhero 2044 calls handicaps, in order to determine what events happen to the character and how much the character is able to improve over time. Both systems are dynamic and change as character and characters interact with the game world. The Golden Hero system is more developed, once again, right? It's like, got the idea, later game develops the idea more fully. And it's part of a more complete system of mechanics. And Golden Heroes is a very unique role-playing game. I highly recommend grabbing a copy or finding a copy if you can. It's a lot of fun. But once again, in this way of the planning sheet, it's in my opinion, unarguably a descendant of the Superhero 2044 system. In closing, I'd like to say I wish I had read the Superhero 2044 rules much sooner than I did. It's a definite diamond in the rough. While it would be difficult to play the game raw, it has a large number of innovative mechanics and ideas. It is actually playable. The combat systems work. It's just building the characters to use the combat systems that's the difficulty. Right? The mechanics are solid character creation, eh, that's where we need to help. Regardless, the fact that it contains enough ideas to influence no fewer than three other superhero games in their design is a significant achievement in and of itself. One cannot truly understand the development of the superhero role-playing game hobby without reading this game. I think, you know, I really do want to try and play the game probably with more experienced gamers and certainly using Wayne Shaw's rules for character design. But there's a part of me that also wants to design my own comprehensive power system in order to add depth. Given the abstract nature of the campaign planning system, I think you could easily adapt that for any other game to use. So I think you should just read that for that and then see how Let's say you're doing one-for-one -one gameplay, right? That would work great for that. The setting lacks microscopic detail in modern settings, but for the time the game was written, it's actually quite intricate. It's a full setting, it's a fully developed setting. And like the game itself, its setting is one that inspires addition and extension rather than being a complete painting. It has spaces for you to fill in and it's got enough that it makes you want to fill in those spaces. So, you know, I'd like to say that Donald Saxman created something pretty special here, and it's something that isn't talked about enough. And I'd love to see someone take the system and make a modern edition out of it. And I know that it would take some work, but I totally think it would be worth it. And, you know, push come to shove, maybe at some point I'll do a retro clone of the game with updated information. Now, there was an updated version of Superhero 2044 kickstarted and funded on Kickstarter that Steve Perrin was hired to design. The game, as near as I can tell, is still somewhere in development hell. Uh, part of that is because Steve Perrin died and course it is a challenging thing to create a role-playing game and a lot of other potholes have delayed that project. A lot of people think that the game will never see the light of day, but I thought that of other games as well that have, in fact, come to fruition. I think the game might eventually be completed, but I have no idea when. I'd, I gotta be honest, I am a backer of that Kickstarter, that original one, and I have a copy of the original playtest rules, so I know that it can be finished. <laughs> 
He just has to make it over that final finish line, but that's tough, and it's, it's a really hard thing to do. That said, I wish that I had personally asked Donald Saxman, while he was still alive, if he would have agreed to work with me to run a Kickstarter for an actual Superhero 2044 second edition. One that is based on the mechanics of the original game, and then incorporate some of Shaw's changes while keeping the rest of the basic system as it is. I think that that's something, one, that would be truly OSR, but I also think it would have been something worth exploring. Given the opportunity, I would have asked some of my experienced designer friends if they wanted to jump in and help too, maybe Alan Barr or somebody else. But what would a more developed version of the original game look like? I do hope uh, that we get to, to find, find out someday. What are your thoughts? Please share them with me and, and let's have a conversation about your favorite superhero role-playing games and maybe your thoughts on Superhero 2044. Thanks for joining me, and I hope to see you again soon. Shall we play a game? This geek of technology. He's a Highlander by God. Strange game. The only winning mood is not to play.